let's pray father god we thank you for who you are lord our hope our life and our future are all based on your character and your goodness towards us your grace towards us your mercy towards us as david himself oh lord says who am i oh lord and what is my house that you have brought brought me thus far and so lord when you look at ourselves you find no reason that you should be so gracious and merciful to us but since you are a good and merciful lord slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love o oh lord because of that and because of that alone o oh lord we receive whatever we have today as christians so we thank you for who you are o oh lord and we thank you that you are still be at that unchanging god so that we can expect the same things tomorrow and for the life to come and as we study this book of revelation as we coming to an end o oh lord i pray o oh lord that you help us to know you uh in a better way oh lord open our eyes to see the truth of scripture and uh, may our faith be strengthened by this study help simon also to speak clearly and may your spirit assist him as he teaches thank you once again in jesus name i pray amen amen thank you thomas sin has different ways to affect man firstly it takes from him everything which is good secondly it makes him desire for the wrong then good and and more importantly and the most important thing that you need to see here is sin does not allow the man to look at the clarity of scripture now that's possibly why god in his immense mercy even when he opens our eyes to see the wonderful things in god's law he helps us with a beautiful thing he you helps us with these contrasting categories in scripture i hope you understand what contrasts are something which is so starkly opposite that you cannot miss the difference between them the bible is so full of contrasts that it will be difficult for you to miss them right from the first book of the bible we have day and night we have man and animals we have work and rest we have angel and the devil we go on we have moses and pharaoh we have israel and nations we have law and grace we have worship and abomination we have mercy and judgment we have mystery and revelation we have lamb and the lion we have the harlot and the bride we have the babylon and jerusalem we have the advocate and we have the judge we have the marriage supper of the lamb and we have the great supper of god brethren god helps us and i think these ideas of contrast are majorly beautifully seen in the book of revelation that chapter after chapter in the middle of the chapter there's almost a pause for us to sh- to be seen something completely different last time we studied the wedding supper of the lamb we studied that everyone is blessed who's invited to the marriage supper everyone who is invited will be found in that marriage dress which the son has bought by his own blood for the saints his righteousness no one will be found in the marriage supper of the lamb without the dress given to him or her by the lamb no part of this dress mind you leaves the bride incomplete in any part so that the bride has to cover herself the dress of this lamb is the beauty of the bride who is waiting preparing herself knowing that the marriage is sure the lord is sure the dress is sure and the covering is sure because the one who has given the dress to her is true today we see 
from a different perspective. You just saw the marriage of the lamp, but today we'll see the supper of God himself, where people are invited to enjoy God and his salvation. You'll see birds of every kind called to eat the flesh in this great supper that God prepares. Do you see that contrast? It's not by accident, my dear brethren. It's for us to understand that either you'll eat at that joy ceremony or those who do not believe in him will be eaten in that rotten moment when flesh-eating animals will devour as if the skins of people who refuse the Lord. But even before we get there, we start from verse 9 where we had stopped and we'll read to verse 16. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said to me, See, thou do not do it. I am the fellow servant and of thy brethren that are the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he would smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. May the Lord bless the reading. The marriage supper of the Lamb is being seen. John, who himself is part of that marriage, is now seeing it. And when he sees that God says, Blessed are the people, the surety is there, and these are true sayings of God. It's not going to change. John, who has just seen the death of Babylon, who sometime back got tempted with this woman, he's now seeing what God does to his people. There's a great joy, and he knows he can't be moved. And in that great joy, do you see what John does? Verse 10, I fell at his feet to worship. And he said unto me, see, thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren. John, in his great excitement of knowing that God is not going to leave the church, all that God is saying is true. These are true words of God, which we'll again see in this chapter again. This is not simply any marriage. This is finality because God has said this. God has destroyed the false churches. God has destroyed everything false. And John is safe. But when John sees that, he fell at the feet of the angel. To worship him. The salvation is so true, so unchangeable, that John does the very act that this book keeps saying man should keep away idolatry. And again, let us repeat this if it was not for God, we would have worshipped every angel on the corner. Joy, John is doing this in great. Happiness, but the mistake is still the same. It's a bad mistake where the angel has to correct him. John, I am a fellow 
your servant like you. I serve God. I'm like your fellow brethren. All of them that have the testimony of Jesus. Brethren, if you ever doubt that the Bible is God's word, if the Bible was not written merely by men, if these are not merely men's ideas, if you need any evidence, this verse is it. Have you ever wondered who's writing this? The great apostle John. One gospel, three letters, one big book of revelation that comes at the end of the canon. The only apostle that has lived a long life. Wouldn't John be tempted? Do I really write this error of mine? Oh, every time I'm in church and telling people and they will look at me and laugh, John, you could do this? How could you, John? You're an apostle. You should have known better. You can't fall in front of an angel and worship it. Brethren, the Bible shows the weaknesses of the strongest and the greatest. And in the weaknesses, what is always seen is God bringing us back to his throne. You remember Peter saying this, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Second Peter 1.20 he says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is a evidence if you want to know that are these words of God they are. Because John, if it was left to him, that great apostle would have wanted to remove this. But let's not stop here. That's not the point that we're discussing today. Look at the answer of the angel again. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And thankfully, brother Bertie asked us a similar question today. Worship God. He alone has to be worshipped even in your greatest happiness, greatest moments of joy, greatest revelations that you get. The only aspect or the only greatest aspect of God is worship God. But he does not stop there. When he says worship God, in the same breath he says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. For the testimony of Jesus. Do you, can you make the link here? He starts by saying, I'm a fellow servant of thy brethren and them have that testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And when he says worship God, he says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This Jesus is God. The whole of Bible prophecy is about him. The entire spirit of prophecy the word spirit here is the same Greek word, which could also be in the context interpreted as the principle. The principle of Bible prophecy is what? The testimony of Jesus. In fact, yesterday, as Dr. Scott was teaching us, he again put this point forward that you have and you should see the Lord in the whole of the Bible. Because everything in the Bible would point to him. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. Now, what's interesting is this. The testimony, the word that's used, is the word from where we get the word martyr. Right? So you have the martyrdom of sorts, if you want to use that word, is the spirit, the death of Jesus the work of Jesus for us is the spirit of prophecy. Now I want you to just for a second think about 
John, chided by the angel for worshipping him rather than God. Now the angel tells him, worship God. Who is this God? Jesus, who is a martyr for you and me, which is the whole of the Bible's prophecy. And then verse 11 says, and I saw heaven opened. Now, brothers, we started with the idea of contrast, and I want you not to lose that. Because now the verse says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The martyrdom of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This Jesus, the lamp who was slain. You just saw the marriage of the lamp. And when heaven opens, you would want John to see the lamp as if he was slain. Won't you? When heaven opened, John would have wanted to see, yes, they're all speaking about the lamp, and now heaven opens, and I'll see the lamp. But the Holy Spirit gives us a beautiful contrast here. The testimony of Jesus, that Jesus that has been martyred, the lamp which was slain, is no longer looking like that lamp who was slain for people whom he is going to come to kill. Look at verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, a new vision. Behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him called faithful and true, and in righteousness he does judge and make war. Remember Palm Sunday? When they screamed, that this king will save us now. That king came on a colt, on an ass, meek, lowly, humble. But they still thought this king would save them. Probably many of them were not even thinking of their immediate salvation. Some of them might be thinking that this king might save them from the Romans. But now when heaven opens, it's not that same image of the lamb that was slain. It's a white horse. It's a warrior. And here the imagery is important because John is writing in the context of the first century who had seen Roman warriors right from Julius Caesar to everyone who comes into Rome after a march, after a victory, as if a victory lap, on white horse. From the time of Julius Caesar, it was common that every king who wants to show that he is victorious would walk in on a white horse. But here, John has to say that your rulers who came on white horses, who came to judge and to kill, they are not the same. Look at how he qualifies the person who sits on that white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judgment and makes war. This son of man on the horse is faithful and true. Verse 9, we said, these are true sayings of God. And now you are faithful and true. And what is his character? In righteousness, he does everything. He judges in righteousness. He makes war in righteousness. In fact, like we learned earlier, if it does not make war, if it does not judge, someone can question his righteousness. But look at him. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And we have done this description before when we described the church of Thyatira. Eyes that can see through. Eyes that can burn. Eyes whose judgments are sharp. Eyes who do not miss anything. Eyes 
that fire that whatever is covered will be burnt up and will be exposed in front of his eyes cover as much as you want if you are not dressed in the covering given by him that flame of fire will burn it down act as much as you want hide as much as you want those eyes cannot miss you beloved today if you are not part of god's children if you're not part of god's elect you think you still are not saved i would ask you to think about that those eyes which in one look can burn his eyes are a flame of fire he will burn but let's look at the description further and in his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no one knew but he himself now i would want you to understand that on his head were many crowns now this need not if you're trying to picture it in your head uh, this need not look like golden crowns kept on one on top of the other uh, something like jagged wearing a cap on his head this is not that image in fact this particular diadem which is made um, was more like a small strap made either of thin flexible gold or sometimes on a cloth piece where which was has a lot of jewels uh, so you could have a king wear multiple of these and each crown would indicate his rule for example the Greek, the roman kings would have multiple crowns to show the kind of areas they ruled over so if they ruled over major two portions of the earth they would be having two crowns and that order and here he has many crowns showing that his rule is over everything and on that he had a name written that no man knew but he himself now beloved there are two ways of looking at this one i'll tell you a verse that makes sense to me uh, the second one also does the second one, but the first one makes more um, easy for you to understand will this name be never known to us we have learned in the book that i'll give each person a stone on which a name is inscribed that only he and i would know that god would give us his name and which shows the kind of intimacy that we would have with god but there's a second view also that we can look at it and it's not wrong both are equally valid uh, in my sense the second way we can even understand that this word no man knew but himself would mean no man can know also why because in in earlier days when someone would say i know his name the idea was a know him completely name was usually also imp implying all that the person stood for so we read in the bible also by his name we are saved so in that sense we may never know god completely we can never know god in all that he is god is our creator and that difference between creator and creation is never going to end even though we are in heaven even though when we get into heaven i've heard people tell me this before that once we reach heaven we'll be able to see god the father no you wouldn't be 
you wouldn't be able to see Trinity. Why? Because the Bible says God is invisible, incomprehensible. The closest thing that you can see God is the man Jesus Christ. And that's what God, the man Jesus Christ also said, right? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father also. So here, when he says he has a name written, but no man would know but himself, could also indicate that this rider, this judge, is completely God and so unknowable to us unless he reveals himself to us. This would be a fitting description of him, at least when we are studying the book of Revelation, because this is the revelation of Christ. And just a little part of him is revealed to us, just a little part of him. Now look at his dressing. He was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. But then we have seen this image before, haven't we, when we studied Isaiah 60? When you read Isaiah 60, we see that particular person and they ask, why are you covered with so much blood to the warrior? And the warrior says, I have tread the winepress alone. We saw that in Revelation 14. One of the most scary scenes in this book, that blood rises up to the level of horse's bridle, that God is going to judge the wicked. You have the same imagery here. I want you to understand that these are not chronological visions, but these are the same vision shown to us from different angles. When you enjoyed seeing the marriage of the bride, now he's welcoming you to enjoy the destruction he's gonna do to these people. His cloth was dipped in blood. Do you see this? Now there are many who interpret this, that maybe this is chronological. Why? Because see, his cloth is already dipped in blood. So this blood cannot be the blood by which he has trampling them and killing them, because killing is yet to happen, right? So this blood could indicate that he died for us on the cross. And it's that blood. But I don't think that fits in. This is apocalyptic literature. The reason that blood is shown to you is to show that this is complete. This is going to happen. Nothing is going to change it. And God, in his mercy to us, hasn't he continuously judged wicked people time and again in the whole history of mankind? Be it Pharaoh, be it the actual Babylon, be it Nebuchadnezzar, God has judged the wicked. And he will finally one day judge the wicked. His blood, his, his vesture, his clothes, is baptized in blood. But what's beautiful is even in that, his name is the word of God. I, when I read this passage, I sometimes wonder, Lord, what a scary scene. And what a contrasting name. Clothes dipped in blood, waiting for judgment, giving judgment. But the word of God, isn't what the word of God does? Doesn't the word of God kill? 
doesn't the gospel my dear brothers kill people who will not believe this vesture dipped in blood his name is called his name is called the word of god beloved every time we preach the word of god every time we preach the word of god it will not return without fulfilling its work the work is not simply saving people the work is not simply glad tidings to people the work is announcement of the end of their empires end of their life end of what is going to happen to them do you remember the good news that was told to pharaoh so to herod a king is going to be born it was good news to the people who went brought it to him that word of god to herod was not a good news it was of news that would judge him because from his mouth of the sun this warrior goes a two sharp sword they should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and to repeat the imagery of isaiah he treaded the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty god but something very strange about this warrior here's a warrior who's coming to fight but have you noticed verse 14 and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean meaning this warrior is not alone there is a huge war going on he has to kill nations he has to rule them with a rod of iron and for that he has got a group of people following with him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean beloved it's not difficult for us to understand who this group is right because we already seen who is dressed in fine linen and white and clean the bride here it's presented as an army they followed on they followed him on what white horses what do white horses indicate we said a victor but here's an interesting thing i want you to do an interesting bible study a uh, part of bible study aspect that you want to do when this king is judging the nations when he's fighting the nations when he's killing the nations can you see how well the army is fighting do you see how many men and women and devils the army is killed Do you see how well they fought? Do you see any of those things that the army does? In fact, if you look at that text, it's it's he was clothed with vesture dipped in blood. His name is called this. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. With it, he should smite. He shall rule. He treaded the wine press. of the fierceness and the wrath of almighty god what was that army doing with him you still if there's anyone who thinks that we are the one who will fight and win this battle of salvation read revelation 19 again he fights he will rule he treads but when he does everything he still makes his beloved come on a white horse 
So that when someone looks at them, they think they have conquered. Yes, they have. That's the reason Paul calls us, we are more than conquerors in the book of Romans. We are more than conquerors. But beloved, what did we do to conquer? He fought alone. This is the story of the entire Bible, isn't it? He started salvation for us. And he is going to kill all our enemies, not us. But the privilege given to us is exactly the privilege of a victor. White horse, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. In fact, that white and clean linen, maybe not an imagery of saying that they did not fight, but it's obvious, isn't it? That the person who fought, who's killing, he is covered with the blood. Who is he? And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The sun is come again to judge. And vision after vision, we're going to see the same judgment from different perspectives. Here he is drenched in blood. After some time, you'll see animals, birds eating flesh. After some time, in Revelation 20, you'll find the angel the beast and everyone bound. But in all of this, there is only one name that would be seen. King of kings and lord of lords. It's very interesting because two verses before, you see that on his crown, there is a name written that no man knows but himself. But on us, on the sash that covers all the way up till his thigh, you have a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. No nation, no person, no devil, no legion of devils will be able to stand he who comes. His dress is dipped in blood. For those who trust in him, he is faithful and true and his judgment is in righteousness. Beloved, how blessed are we that God calls us as his army. When you look at the book of Revelation, the beauty, the imagery that God has used to show his people from the idea of a temple to 1,44,000 in God's square to the holy city to the beautiful bride and now to this beautiful scene of an entire army on white horses mm -hmm. Clothes in fine linen, mm -hmm. white and clean. Amen. God has asked us to see the beauty of who He is in that word, King of Kings. Mm -hmm. The way the word is being showed is as if the coronation is going on or at least everyone understands who the emperor is there is no one who can challenge him 
we stand there at that beautiful vision when heaven opened. Because every time we think about Jesus, we think of him as a lamp, we think of him as a word of God, but we need to think that this word of God is going to kill righteously everyone that has stood against him. Mm. At the same time, his armies did not do a thing. They did not do anything to win. Mm. But they won because the sun fought for them. He alone trod the wine press all alone. And in all of that, he showed the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. But then when we give the word of God to people, do we really see it as both these things? Wrath to those who are perishing. But the blessing of arriving in fine linen, white and clean as his army. Let's thank God that even though we are not worthy, in Jesus, we are called more than conquerors. In him and in him alone, in nothing else. Let's look to God in prayer. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. God, the hallelujah is not there at the end of that. Help, Lord, that every believer who hears that word, that phrase, King of kings and Lord of lords, would automatically say hallelujah. Praise him. He alone is to be praised. He alone is glorious. He alone is true. He alone judges in righteousness. Thank you, God, that in the middle of a burning city, you, saw the, you showed us the vision of the marriage supper. And before we could move away, you showed us even more glorious. The warrior on the white horse, the king of kings and the lord of lords, to which every knee shall bow. Master, we thank you for teaching us so many things. Thank you for teaching us that your word is inspired. It can never go wrong. When the entire world goes wrong, this will not change. This will stay. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us that the Bible is not ink marks on paper. This is the eternal word. So when books are burned, the word of God is not destroyed. But rather, this word of God will one day open books to judge this world righteously. Let our whole life, Lord, be desirous to see that day when we can stand and say we belong to the Lamb. In the name of the Lamb, we offer this prayer. Amen.